Look at Dubai. I mean, what an incredible story that Dubai has had focused on tourism to become one of the top destinations in the world. As the CEO of Ras Al Khaimah Tourism Development Authority, Raki has been at the helm of transforming this UAE Emirate into a global hotspot. Tourists love it. So if we go from domestic and now we move into international and you look at where we located in the world, we're in the center of the world, connected to top five busiest airports in the world. He has also been instrumental in establishing the Ras Al Khaimah Digital Assets Oasis, the world's first and only common law free zone dedicated to digital and virtual assets companies. I always joke when I meet people, I say you're looking at the bureaucracy because things move very fast in our emirate. Decisions get made very, very quickly. I went around trying to get a job in the hotel business. I went door to door, every hotel, no one would hire me. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the podcast in partnership with our awesome sponsors. More about them later. Now, if you like this podcast and you're watching me right now, if you could do me a massive favor and subscribe to this channel, it would mean the world. And if you're listening and it's on, I don't know, on podcast platforms, whether it's Spotify, whether it's um, Apple Podcasts or whichever one that you use, any feedback you give me, any likes, any comments, any any opinions telling me if the show is good, telling me if the show is bad, telling me if you'd like different guests. All of this is really valuable to me. We spend a lot of time, effort and energy putting this show together so that you can have a good experience and you can listen to the stories of the incredible guests that we have. So if I could ask that in return, it would mean the world to me and I thank you in advance. Right, today's guest. Here in the UAE, everyone knows about Dubai. Many people know about Abu Dhabi. But do you know about a place called Ras Al Khaimah? Well, the CEO of Rack Tourism Authority is on the podcast today. Raki Phillips is joining it. As the CEO of Ras Al Khaimah Tourism Development Authority, Raki has been at the helm of transforming this UAE emirate into a global hotspot. He has also been instrumental in establishing the Ras Al Khaimah Digital Assets Oasis, the world's first and only common law free zone dedicated to digital and virtual assets companies. From his early days with industry giants like Ritz-Carlton and Fairmont Hotels to orchestrating a groundbreaking $3.9 billion deal with Wynn Resorts, Raki is at the forefront of transforming Ras Al Khaimah into a global hub for tourism and Web3 innovation. And today we're going to learn all about Ras Al Khaimah, why you should go there, why you should visit, why you should buy there, why you should spend time there, why you should set your business up there and learn that the UAE is far more diverse than you would think it was. So cue the music and get into a great learning experience from Racky Phillips and Ras Al Khaimah here on the show. So let's talk about the megaverse, the internet of people. Shaping the next iteration of the internet, megaverse is powered by revolutionary blockchain technology built on decentralized community ownership. It offers users, brands, and businesses a seamless, regulated, and transparent opportunity for growth, revenue, and community building. Megaverse is accelerating user adoption and achieving these goals through multiple verticals like MegaChain, a high-performance blockchain for tamper-proof transactions, MegaFile system for encrypted decentralized storage, and Mega Studio, which democratizes development through collaborative and AI elements. Organizations across industries like Dubai Multi Commodities Center, Dubai World Trade Center, and Ras Al Khaimah government have already explored the lucrative potential of a Megaverse presence. Megaverse enables users to create a Web3 future for the people, where technology serves human purposes. Dive in and discover the internet of people with Megaverse today. Raki, thank you so much for coming to join us on the podcast today. Morning, Spencer. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's talk about Ras Al Khaimah. Absolutely. Wow. Look, there's seven emirates that most people outside of this country don't necessarily know. So we've got these seven emirates. The, the Abu Dhabi is the biggest one. Mm -hmm. uh, Dubai is the most famous one. Yeah. Um, Sharjah has the one with the most uh, Indians that seem to want to live in Sharjah <laughs> when we look at that. And then we have these other emirates that a lot of people won't know about, or Mal Quain, Ajman, etc. But Rack decided to put itself on the map a little while ago, didn't it? Absolutely. Tell us about that. 
So listen, it, it, it's a, it, the emirate, as you had said, is made up of seven emirates. Rak, Ras al Khaimah is the northernmost emirate. Um, we are blessed with an unbelievable topography. Our location being 45 minutes outside of Dubai International Airport means we're a gateway to the world. We've got great accessibility. But when you look at a topography perspective, people think of the UAE as a desert or skyscrapers. And you come to Rak and we actually provide the highest mountain in the UAE with Jebel Jais, it's 1,934 meters, 64 kilometers of white sand beach and a desert. And that's a very few places in this part of the world and especially in the UAE that offers this to you. And we've been able to really embrace that and look, and look at how from a topography perspective, the culture of three different tribes that make up the Emirate that also have historical context to them. And also when you look at the history of Ras al-Khaimah, this is a entrepreneurial emirate. Rack Ceramics, the third largest ceramics manufacturer in the world. Jurafar Pharmaceutical was the first um, generic drug manufacturing company um, in the region, one of, one of the largest. Um, Rack Rocks, I mean, Palm Island was built from the rocks from Jebel Jais. The, when you go to the beaches in the Maldives, some of that beautiful sand is made in Ras al-Khaimah. So as a manufacturing emirate and an entrepreneurial emirate, we've now over the last few years, I'd say close to 10 years, the focus has been on tourism. And the reason is tourism is a great contributor to the livability of people. Look at Dubai. I mean, what an incredible story that Dubai has had focused on tourism to become one of the top destinations in the world. And in Ras al Khaimah, and when you look at other places, Barcelona, when they, when I think it was the Olympics, and they focused on the Olympics and became a tourist hub, and places, you know, my own hometown of Orlando, Florida, is a tourism hub. Um, those are places that contribute so positively to livability, and that's where we see the future of Ras al Khaimah going. When we look at the Emirate itself, some people haven't haven't heard much about it, and you're right, it's a very different Emirate. To, I mean, I'm there every Saturday morning hiking, so so. Well, I appreciate. I, that. <laughs> I, 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 I'm a fan, but you know, a lot of people say to me, I didn't even know there were mountains in the UAE, let alone the kind of mountains that we talk about with Jebel Jace, etc. But I, I still see Rack as a little bit of this hidden gem mm. because even though you've got the topography, and we can talk about that. People don't really know yeah. much about it. Yeah. They don't really know. If they should go on vacation there, what, why should they go on vacation there? What is there to do there? So maybe we can just give people some better understanding of that so that, so that they have context when we move to the next part of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So with Ras al Khaimah, we are the number, let's start domestically, right? We are the number one destination for uh, your staycations. So in the UAE, the majority of people will come if they think of a staycation, as we like to call it a shortcation, because it is such a convenient drive, Rack is your number one option. And the reason people go there is one, we're blessed with space. So if you pick any one of our hotels, you've got, I mean, one of our hotels has a 1.6 kilometer beachfront. Um, uh, it, it, you, you're blessed with space. It's a place where you go to relax. Sun and sand and beach and, and uh, relaxation is really the key to what, what the Emirate offers from a tourism perspective. That's one side of it. The other side of it is really the adventure side of it. There's no place that can offer you nature-driven adventure. So you go to Jebel Jais, the highest mountain in the UAE, and you've got the longest zip line in the world, the Jebel Jais flight. Then you've got our toboggan uh, uh, ride, the Jais Sledder, that is just an, ex an incredible experience that you can do with the family or you can do yourself and you control the speed of it. And, and, and to have that toboggan experience on the mountains, great. And then we've got um, multiple other attractions there on the mountain and the hiking trails. I mean, the hiking trails, you know, you're, you're an avid hiker, um, but there are some gems. I've been in Iraq for over five years and I still discover new trails, new hiking trails and, and things that you go, wow, this is pretty impressive. Um, I don't know if you've gone down the hike where at the Hidden Valley, mm -hmm. where you, you go on this beautiful hike and then you go, you go down a valley and it's an oasis. I mean, it's green, it's beautiful. You see the, 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 the mountain goats that are there, there's the farmland. And you don't expect that in a place um, in the UAE. And then you go up the mountain and it's a pretty, uh, pretty strenuous hike. And then you go to the end of it and, and, and you're greeted with just some nature. After it rains, you get to see the waterfalls. 
So that natural element of of Ras al Khaimah is, is 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 quite exciting. And then I think the third element that that is really the history that the Emirate has um, over seven thousand years of history exists in Ras al Khaimah. Everything from the Bronze Age, where we found some unbelievable sites, we have four tentative UNESCO heritage sites. So I'll tell you, Via Fort, which is which is a beautiful fort, was the last battalion that stood against the British invasion. So I mean that history that's there. Jazir al Hamra was a historical fisherman. It was the last fisherman's village for a community before the discovery of oil. And and we've 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 gone through the incredible process of restoration to make it a true tourist attraction. And one of the really coolest experiences that you can do in Iraq. Um, is the Suwaidi pearl farm. And there's a gentleman, Abdullah Suwaidi, who his grandfather was a pearl diver. His father wasn't and he wasn't because obviously with the discovery of oil and then when Japan was cultivating pearls, the pearl diving industry sort of deteriorated in the UAE and he wanted to bring that back. So he built a pearl farm where you go and you experience this beautiful boat ride. You see the camels cooling down in the water. You see the flamingos on the mangroves. And you actually go and he walks you through the process of pearl diving. You go down and he picks up an oyster and you get the oyster and then you open it and you might actually get a real life pearl in it. Tourists love it. So if we go from domestic and now we move into international and you look at one, where are we located in the world? We're in the center of the world, connected to one of the busiest airports, the top five busiest airports in the world. You've got, you know, when it's cold in Europe or in the CIS market or anywhere, our weather here is perfect. Plus, if it does get a little bit hot, you know, Rack is about three to four degrees cooler because we are a a little more north. And then when you go up Jebel Jace, you're talking about a 10 degree swing in temperature. So it does get a, a little bit cooler. It's fun. So tourists, um, we, we, our top source markets include the UK, Germany, the CIS region is quite big for us, um, Czech Republic and India. But we're quite diversified as you go after our top five. And and we've really targeted all markets from South Africa to Romania to Italy. I mean, all of those are source markets that are growing as, as well as China. And the exciting part about it is we are a destination of the future. What you see today is going to be very transformative in the next few years. Wow. You know, you said some things, and I've lived here 20 years, and some things I've heard now that I'm like, oh, I might want to go and do that. Good. So that's really good. Mission accomplished. Yeah. So when, when we think about Rack, though, there's obviously the, the connection now to Las Vegas mm-hmm. and the, you know, this, this city that was brought up in the middle of the desert in, in Nevada that became something out of nothing and grew to become the monster that it is today, you know, one of the top tourist destinations in the world with some of the most fantastic hotels and more importantly, gambling. Mm. And when you look at the UAE, they've, they've accepted alcohol uh, within the country as being you know, permissible, whereas when you look at Saudi Arabia, for example, they've decided to go uh, against that. We look at the, the Emirates, all of the Emirates here, and it's very relaxed and very accessible and very easy. I mean, I love the people that have these opinions about the UAE. They've never visited, you know, <laughs> oh, but what, well, can you take your clothes off on the beach? Or, you know, yeah. Can, can I get a glass of wine? Women allowed to drive. Yeah, women allowed yeah. to drive, yeah. Or vote or whatever. <laughs> it's all right, we've moved on. And and I, I look at what's, what's, what's coming and it seems to be very exciting. Now, it appeared to me for a while that there was a bit of a race that was going on. Mm. Because Blue Water Island here in uh, Dubai was established and Caesar's Palace went there and people were saying, oh, that's going to be the new casino. And then this other island that's being built very close to the Burj Al Arab, that's going to be the new casino. But this multi-billion dollar contract was signed with Wynn Hotels and this huge construction that's taking place at the moment is definitely heading very fast in the right direction. Uh, is Rack going to be the first place that we have casinos in this part of the world? So Spencer, you've been here 20 years. This is, we are very blessed to be in the UAE because the UAE, though, is a very progressive nation. When you look at the way things move, things move at a very smart pace, but things move at a very fast pace. Um, 
at the end of the day, any decision that we make in the UAE has to have a positive impact on the community. Um, things do take time to progress. So, um, and, as, and for us, everything that we do in Iraq has a big focus on a couple of things. Livability, what, how does that improve livability? Um, is it a driver of tourism? And is it going to cause prosperity, not just to the Emirate, but to the UAE in, uh, in, gener in general? Um, when is the largest foreign direct investment um, that has taken place in the Emirate of Ras Al Khaimah? I think what was announced was $4 billion. Today, it's, it, it's over that. Um, when you look at Win as a brand, it is arguably one of the best operators in the world uh, in what they do. Um, you look at markets around the world that have thrived from the tourism growth that comes out of um, out of a project like when Singapore, for example. It's incredible when you think of Singapore, of everything that it offers from tourism, from business, from connectivity, from safety and security. This is really where I think a lot of the UAE looks at where the great examples of the world are and where the bad ones are and how can we be better? How can we thrive to make things better? Wynn has been an incredible catalyst to driving of tourism, driving of, of investments. And we think that this will be a, a, an obvious game changer, not just to the Emirate, but to the UAE in general. It is one of the largest projects that's currently under development um, in the country, if not in the region. Um, the beauty of it is when you look at a resort that's going to offer, it's an integrated resort, uh, 1,500 keys, We'll have multiple restaurants, multiple attractions, uh, theater shows, everything. But look at everything else that's being built around it. Um, the hotel pipeline that's coming up from the announcement that we've had other than Wynn, Nobu Hotels, W Hotels, JW Marriott, Nikki Beach. I mean, these are great global brands that are coming up. All of this will be able to contribute to what, um, the, what our tourists are looking for. Um, the expansion of the airport. You know, last year we had 600,000 passengers go through Iraq International Airport. Our goal is to get to 2 million. Today we have 8,000 keys, hotel keys in the market. By the end of the decade, we will more than double that to be at 16 to 20,000 keys. I have, I welcomed last year 1.2 million tourists, 1.22 million tourists to be exact. Um, we are looking to triple the number of tourists to get to 3.5 million overnight guests and about 1.5 million day use visitors. So doubling the number of room nights in the destination, tripling the number of, of visitors, all of those are factors that are going to contribute to tourism and it is going to be diverse. But what I will tell you, Spencer, is when we do things, we like to do them right. We like to do them in collaboration and we don't necessarily make the big flashy announcements until specific timelines and until specific thresholds are met. So are you telling me that there might be a casino? <laughs> I think I think there's been announcements that have made, but it really relies... Well, everyone, everyone thinks, uh, the general public thinks that Rack's having a casino built. It, 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 the Win Integrated Resort Project, um, it, the gaming is going to be part of it. However, it makes up 4% of the space uh, of the built up area. So there's a significant amount of other attractions that are being built around that development from restaurants to theaters, to shows, to everything that, uh, uh, that, that will be built. But I'm more focused on the tourism element of it. I would leave that conversation for when there is a federal regulator that has been announced, the, the, the GCGRA. So they would be able to give you more details on what's happening. But I will tell you that everything that we're doing is um, is very much aligned with our impressive tourism growth that we're excited about. Look, I think it's easy for me because I'm not a gambler, so I don't. <laughs> I don't I, uh, Neither am I. So if I if I go to Las Vegas, I'm going there for the attractions. I'm not going there for any slot machines and, and stuff I, like that. And I think I mentioned to you that in Vegas, 60% uh, of the people that go there um, uh, don't gamble. So really, it, it's it, it's everything else that the attractions that come with a city like Las Vegas uh, or Macau or um, Singapore or anything or anything of the sorts. Mm, okay, understood. Now, talk to me a little bit about you. Yeah. Okay, you've got this fancy title, you know, the CEO of Rack TDA. And so people that would receive your business card and wouldn't have got to know you a little bit like I have might go, 
about this guy's <laughs> super important dude here, you know, let's uh, let, let's treat him as very kind of you. You know, you always like, <laughs> people see the business, oh, you know, how do I approach this guy? What what kind of guy are you to be a CEO? Is it, Are you a you know, a typical MBA student that's gone through these, this, this corporate ladder to become one? Or are you somebody who was just focused on doing a really good job of what you did and opportunities came your way? Um, so I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in hard work does pay off. Um, I'm also a big believer in patience. Sometimes I think that's my best quality, but a lot of times I think it's my worst quality because <laughs> I am super patient uh, when, when it comes to things. But I told you a little bit about my background. I mean, I, um, uh, um, I remember uh, when, I, when I started, started college, um, I went into college at 17 years old and I was having a blast. Typical lifestyle where you're going out, you're young, you're enjoying it's your first uh, vow of freedom. Um, and I was a freshman going into my second year with a 1.8 GPA, which isn't very good. Um, and I remember my dad, very practical man. You know, my dad's American. My mom is half Lebanese, half Argentinian. And my dad called me up and said, son, school's not for you. You're just, you know what, you're, you're not doing well. It's a waste of your time. You got to find a trade. You got to be a mechanic or something along those lines. I said, all right. You know, so, so I, I'll never forget. I have a friend of mine who today is a, is a very successful pediatrician. Um, and I bumped in. She's like, she's like, Rocky, you look down. What's wrong with you? I said, my dad thinks I'm a loser and he wants me to go be a mechanic. And she goes, and I have one week to tell my dad what I want to do for the rest of my life. Because my dad was like, I give you a week, make up your mind, figure it out. And she looked at me and said, you need to be in the hotel business. And we were, I, was, I was maybe 17 years old, 18 years old at the time. And I said, really? She goes, yeah, you know, my brother's studying it. You've got the personality for it. I think you should be in the hotel business. That's what you tell your dad. Yeah. So my dad called me up and said, Rocky, did you decide what you want to do with you? I said, yeah, dad, I want to be in the hotel business. So he says, great. I give you two options, Orlando or Vegas, because if you're going to be in this industry, you got to be in the best place in the world for it. So I flipped a coin and it landed in Orlando and I moved there. Moved to Orlando. My dad, very practical guy, said, I'm going to pay your rent for three months. Uh, I will pay your education as long as you get good grades. And then you got to figure out the rest by yourself. So I went there, got into a school, got my rent. And then I went around trying to get a job in the hotel business. I went door to door, every hotel. No one would hire me. Really? So I, I, No one would hire me. I don't have the experience. And so I called my dad. I said, dad, no one's giving me a job. He goes, yeah, you've got a goatee and a ponytail, <laughs> you know? Why don't you shave <laughs> and, get a, and get a haircut? So, so I shaved in that. And my first, my first job was, I was a sandwich artist at Subway. So that's where I got into the industry, you know? And I do consider F&B being a big part of hospitality yeah, yeah. and tourism. So I got a job at Subway and- Hold on, well, what's a sandwich artist? That's a, fancy, that's, that's a fancy name for a guy who makes sandwiches. Really? <laughs> I love it. As I said, there was a guy once I spoke to. He Is said, it not on my CV? Did you he not said, see it? <laughs> he said he was a vision technician. And I'm like, what's that? He said, I'm a window cleaner. <laughs> There you go. You know, regardless of what the job is, you 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 can make it. You can make it really good. And so, uh, so yeah, started as a sandwich artist in Subway. It was great. You know, really enjoyed it. I, you know, I, I I realized I'm I'm a guy who enjoys work and and can put a lot of fun into in, into the job I do. Then I started getting into, and I was like, I really want to get into hotels. So I remember my first job. I worked at a Howard Johnson's on International Drive. I mean, it was a sixty room motel. And I did everything at that hotel from front desk to maintenance, to housekeeping. I mean, you know, you just, you just run the full gamut. Meanwhile, I'm doing full credits at, at work and I, at school, you know, going full time um, at university, got into a, a, a hospital, a hotel program, a hospitality program in school, and was really working 40 hours a week and going, you know, full credits at, at school. But I started doing odd jobs. I did everything from, I was an airport shuttle driver for a Sheraton. I was front desk, I was concierge, I was doing everything. Um, and then I saw an internship program at, uh, um, at my university for Universal Studios. And when you're from Orlando and you're in the industry, there's two big employers, it's either Disney or Universal. So, you, so that's the dream is, is to work for them. So I signed up for this internship, which was an apprenticeship and, and you go in, they take 20 students and out of 20, two get 
a full-time job, a, a management job or a supervisory job. And I went into this program and I just worked and, and networked and, and there were, I would work weekends, mornings, nights, you, you, you name it. I, I would jump in. And I was one of the guys that ended up um, chosen as one of the two that got the job. Wow. And I was a supervisor at a place called Destination Universe. I was a vacation planner. So when you and your family would come to Orlando, I'd be the guy in the lobby that would greet you and tell you about everything to do for Universal in Orlando, sell you theme park tickets, you know, do that. I just sort of worked my way up and, and, and had an incredible 70 year career with, uh, with, with Universal Studios. Did everything from uh, park sweeping, you know, uh, uh, working at Cinnabon, um, to opening hotels, to sales. You know, I think uh, at the end, I think I was um, I was a manager of a, of a of a division that was generating ninety million dollars a year. So I mean, I was I was moving up pretty pretty fast at Universal. And one of the greatest lessons I learned during my time at Universal is I was a small meetings manager uh, for 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 the hotels at Universal. And, and when you get into your career and, and you do small meetings, you get bumped by all the big meeting guys. So you try to, you're the guy that fills in the gaps in the meeting rooms um, with business. And I did something funny or, or, I, um, or, or I, I put something in when I wasn't supposed to. And I got called into my VP's office and, you know, I must've been 22, 23 years old. And I still remember her name, Susan Barnes. And she looked at me and said, what you did was wrong. And I have to tell you, um, this is going to leave an impression on me. And 10 years from now, when someone calls and asks about you, is this going to be your defining moment? Or are you going to do things that are going to um, change your reputation? Because she said, the only thing you have in your career is your reputation. Mm -hmm. Spencer, that resonated so much with me that I said, I need to always make sure that regardless of what I do, whether you help people, whether you negotiate a good deal, a bad deal, whether you agree, whether you disagree, you do it respectfully and you make sure you maintain your, your, your reputation and your ethics and, and what's important to you. And that resonated with me till, till today. And I'm proud to say that I think when you talk to people in the industry or someone that I've worked with or someone that I worked for or my colleagues or team or peers, I try to hope that I can have a positive impact on them and, and maintain that reputation. It's, it's this, you know, social media has this place in the world where people are building a personal brand. But to me, a personal brand is your reputation. Thousand percent. You know, that, thousand that, percent. That, that, that's it. Yeah. You know, and, you know, people, people, if you're honest and you make mistakes along the way, people accept that. Yeah. You know, if you hide it, they don't. Yeah. And so uh, that resonates with me too. How, can I ask how old you are? I'm 45. Okay. So you're yeah. much younger than me. Yeah. When we when we look at your career, you look a lot younger though. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. When we look at when we look at your career here in the UAE, yeah. When, when I when I first came here, I lived in many different countries, and you know, the opportunity to come and live here in 2000, end of 2004, beginning of 2005, it was a uh, a place that was still, to many in many respects, an oil town. Yeah. Okay. It was a place that. You know, they built this big hotel, this fancy hotel, mm. but not not many people kind of knew about it or understood it. I remember my parents saying, oh, we went on vacation there last year and they didn't come to Dubai. They actually stayed in Jebel Ali, the Jebel Ali Resort. <laughs> and my mom was, I couldn't believe how far it was to the gold souk. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, did you go to Dubai? She said, well, we were definitely in Dubai. And I'm like, mm, maybe you weren't. And I, and, I, and I look at how it was then, and I loved it back then. Yeah. And I came into this town, you know, I lived in the Greens, and uh, there was three months there, then I moved to Um Sakim, and it was kind of like, you know, I used to go for a run in Safa Park, and kind of everyone knew everyone. Safa Park was great. Was I have to admit, I mean, when I first moved here, it, Safa Park was, was was the place you'd go for boot camp and everything, so I could yeah. resonate with you. Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't, I never used to be able to run, and so Safa Park, once I was able to run all the way around Safa Park, I even know it's 4.3 kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was this place that I loved. Anyway, this, this kind of like, this monster of a city. Yeah. And, and, and this country has grown and whether it's Abu Dhabi and Sadia and Yas and everything else going down there, whether it's right, whether it's here, there's just been this, this, this massive amount of growth, which some people don't like. Yeah. Okay. And some people do. 
Comparing to when you first got here, and let's remove the CEO of yeah. Racti tour, Tourism and, and, and the kind of like the, the hospitality guy in you. Yeah. As a human being living here, how it's changed over the years, how has that impacted you and how do you think about the changes? I love it. Because, so, so if you look at my um, uh, strength finders, you know, if it, you, know I mean, you can do the strength finders things and you look at your top five qualities, my number one quality is futuristic. I am all about what's next. I'm all about the future. I'm all about places that are progressing. And to me, the progression that the UAE done it has done is absolutely incredible. And they're not done. The growth that it, that it shows, to me, I love it. I love that there's new neighborhoods. I love driving and seeing the scaffolding that's happening. But I love seeing that in Ras Al Khaimah as well, because as I said, it is a destination of the future. So I can see that We've got a white canvas right now, but what are we doing to get to where we need to? And what's the journey to get there? So, so in, in, in Ras Al for example, we have hired Gensler, who's one of the number one um, uh, master developers in the world. And what we are master developing just in the tourism sector is the size of South Beach. So when you think about that, and w how do you build it? What do you do? Where do you put the hotels? Where do you put the residences? Where do you put the anchors? where you put the attractions, all of those are going to have a pretty unique impact um, uh, uh, in, in the future of, of the Emirates. So when I look at the UAE and I look at the progression and I look at other parts of the world that haven't progressed as fast, um, this excites me a lot. One, from a tourism perspective, it's, it's an incredible story, but also from how the community has progressed. Um, you know, we were talking about, uh, earlier about you know, you're allowed to take your, you know, to, to be in a bathing suit on the beach. I was at a conference recently and, and uh, a, a lady I was sitting next to asked me, you know, I, she said, I lived in the UAE for three months and I hated it and I left. And I said, what did you hate about it? And she said, um, I just didn't like the way they treated women. And I, I said, really? I, what was your experience? And I, you know, they're very conservative and, you know, for whatever. And then I, I went into the, the speech to say, um, I don't think you realize how progressive the UAE is as a Muslim country. And her concern was women wearing headscarves. So I said, um, have you ever thought about the men wearing head, um, you know, uh, wearing the gutra? You know, I mean, have you ever thought that that might, it's not a sign of oppression. It's a culture. It's a sign of choice. It's, it could be religion. It could be multiple, multiple factors that the, the, uh, the plane. And I, I, I will credit uh, Sam Kazim, who's the CEO of Dubai tourism actually told me, uh, gave me that line where someone had asked him and he said, as an Emirati, I wear the headgear. No one ever asks me about wearing the headgear. They only ask about the women. Um, and I use that line. Um, uh, so I credit him for it, but I also said, um, Nuns wear heads, scarves. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Jewish women of faith shave their heads and 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 wear um, wigs. wigs. I said, I said all of that, and I said, do you realize that in the UAE, by law, fifty percent of the ministerial roles are women? And she said, I had no idea. And I said, and that's not, that's they're not. And I said, do you know how much it is in the U.S., my home country? I said, I said it's less than 30% of women in government and leadership in, in leadership and government are women. The UAE is 50%. And it's not just symbolic. They run the country. They, they move it. They impact it. When I look at my leadership team, um, I have gender equality between the men and women on my team. I look at the progression of women on my team. I look at how um, things are growing. So when we talk about progress, I don't look at it just from the real estate boom, the attractions, the things. And God knows there's a lot of mistakes that have been done, but what's beautiful about the UAE is it works on its mistakes, it fixes them and it moves forward to something bigger and better, but they've done it in society as well. Women today are such an impactful part of the culture, but they've always been. It's just now the, the rest of the world, I think is catching on and, and figuring out. So I'm a big fan of the changes. That's, that's a, a really important point, actually, and something that's not discussed as much. Let's let's make some comparisons here. You, you when when I look at I don't know long distance runners. Years ago, I used to watch the Olympics, and we've got that coming up now. And we had three famous runners: we had S Sebastian Cohen, Steve Ove. They also have the Rack Marathon. I just want to <laughs> throw that plug in there. <laughs> 
And when and when when I used to watch it, I used to I always watch the guy that was sitting not not in the lead, but he was on the back. He was looking over the shoulder of the guy, or if he was he was two back, so he could see who was in front of him. And he would be the guy that would kick in the last two hundred meters. And the guys in front were having to look back to see where he was coming from, but the guy behind knew where he was going, and generally he could accelerate and take on and win. And that t- tended to happen over and over again for the gold medal. I. I look at that and, and that's symbolic to me in the way that it's like it's the underdog, okay, or not the favourite, okay, that sat there waiting, waiting, waiting. When we look at Dubai and we compare it with Abu Dhabi, we will say that Abu Dhabi is trying to play catch up to get to that point and it's doing a very good job of it. But it's almost like there's this little outlier up in the north that, that people may be not watching as closely as they should. And I wonder if that psychologically for you is is a great motivator for you to kind of like really say, well, you watch us, you, you just watch. Absolutely. I will tell you, even when you, when you look at my career, I didn't work for Disney. I worked for Universal Studios. Uh-huh. You know, you work for the, you know, working for the second biggest company in, in, in Orlando gives you more flexibility. You're not the big black stretch limo. You're the little sports car that can bend, um, uh, that can go on the, on the turns faster and, and, and tighter. When I, when I got into hotels, I worked for Ritz Carlton, not Four Seasons. And, you know, I worked- Tell there. me what the significance of that is. And it, it's, it's it, when, you, when you look at brands, sometimes you say, you know, the, the, the number one, you know, and I'm talking years ago, right? Disney was a bigger company than Universal Studios from a theme park perspective. They yeah. had four theme parks, Universal Studios had one. Today, you know, 20 years later, Universal Studios in Orlando is really far more creative and doing things that are that are pretty impressive. I mean, Disney's a fantastic company, but when you come from behind, it allows you to be able to do things different. It allows you to take bigger risks. You have a little less bureaucracy. You can make things better. And throughout my career, I've always been um, in that position and I love it. So I absolutely relish in it. Russell Hama gives us the opportunity where we don't have um, uh, we don't have all of the resources that maybe our competitors do, or or I shouldn't say maybe our competitors, but but you know I mean look at Saudi the boom that they're going through tourism it's incredible it's something that makes you proud what Doha has done also with the World Cup what Abu Dhabi is doing and and the rest it's something proud. but we might not have the resources that they have but we've got the drive, we've got the ambition, and we're a lot more nimble. We don't have the bureaucracy. I always joke when I meet people, I say, you're looking at the bureaucracy because things move very fast in our emirate. Decisions get made very, very quickly. Um, And I think that's really sentiment to the leadership that we have. I mean, mean, His Highness Sheikh Saud uh, bin Sakhir al-Qasimi is such an open-minded, progressive leader that drives us to say, you have to achieve this. You have to do this. Follows up with us when we do it. And, and that resonates throughout the entire leadership of the Emirates. Um, uh, and that's what's great because we're still a small community. So if we need something to happen, I can pick up the phone and call the, the CEO of, of Rack Transport. I can call municipality. I can call the head of that. And things can work very, very fast and, and we can move. And I love that. And I always say this to the team. Five years ago, I think Russell Hema might have been a little bit too small. And I think five years from now, we're going to be a little too big. This right now is the sweet spot where we can have the biggest impact and make stuff happen. And absolutely. And I think to, to, to what I had earlier said, we're not, we're not big and flashy. We don't like to show off. We wait until something happens and then we announce it. Um, and that's really, that works quite well for us. And, and we're happy being in that lane. Not just tourism, though. Ras al Khaimah is really pushing heavily on being a, a, a business location as well. It's trying to get many people to come in and establish their businesses there. The discussions around golden visas, uh, taking into consideration digital assets as well now, the crypto yeah. world. Yeah. You know, I was up, I, I was I was literally six months ago, I was like, you've got to be at this conference on this day. And I'm like, no problem at all. And I didn't even think it was in Iraq. I thought it was in <laughs> Dubai. And so I got in the car ready to go. And I'm like, where is it? I'll put it into my Google Maps. And it was like, I'm like, wow, we're going to, we're going to a, crypto conference yeah. in rack yeah. and so clearly and obviously uh, um uh rack free zone as well has done i mean i don't know what the numbers are but a colossal number of companies have yeah. been established up there uh, over the course of the last few years as well so it seems to be this kind of like this this all-out approach this assault 
okay, on, you know, building the name of this location, building this Emirate in terms of uh, its publicity and its media positioning to let everyone know there's so much that you can do here. Yeah. And that's for me really exciting because 20 years ago when I was going up, up to Iraq, you know, there, there was there was nothing there. You know, there literally was nothing. And to see that sort of change has been great. I remember the first time I rode a bike up Jebel Jace. Some people said, we're going to go and ride up a mountain. And I was like, okay, fine, that'll be fun. And I was the guy that rides around on the flat in Dubai. And then I hit the bottom of that, that hill. <laughs> and that's a steep hill. Man, that's yeah. 20 kilometers long. That was the, that was definitely an experience for me, my first hill in the UAE wow. and, um, and then the speed coming down. But I, I look at people that make a decision in their career like you to go to places like that and say, you know what? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the, it's the, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? It's that, it's that person that's, that's willing to take a chance on something that could be really good is inevitably the person that if it does turn out good, that does very well from it. Absolutely. I mean, for me, I do say I'm a bit of a risk taker and, and as a CEO, my job is assessing risk. I get presented with tons of opportunities every day, tons of decisions that need to make. And, and my job is to quickly say, assess this risk. How how risky is this? If it's a low risk item, let's move on and move things. If it's a if it's riskier, let's let's analyze it. Um, it, it but the beauty of Iraq is the excitement of why I have in, loved and enjoyed my career, and the reason why I joined was because it was a white canvas. Was because you can see things growing, you can see things moving. Um, it, it, we are a group of CEOs that actually get along and work quite well together. So you had mentioned Rack, as you had mentioned uh, Rack Digital Asset Oasis, Rack Dow. The two CEOs that run those companies are people that I can rely on. I can pick up the phone, we can call, we can have a conversation, mm -hmm. we can bounce ideas off of. Yes, we're all in our lanes of expertise, but we contribute to the greater benefit of the Emirate. And there, and there's something about that that's so extremely rewarding when you're all working as 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 a group together. It's the same thing with the team at Merjan that has gone through a tremendous transformation um, uh, from from a real estate development. But we all work well together because if I'm doing my job in tourism um, and someone else isn't, that has a negative impact on me, and vice versa. So for us, um, that is the exciting part about Rack. Um, is one, we are providing a better lifestyle for the people of Rack. So today we have a population of 400,000 people, 450,000 people. That's going to grow to about 650,000 people. But what, what comes with it is the education, better schools. What comes with it is better hospitals. What comes with it is better accommodation, malls, attractions, restaurants. Um, but also if you want to register your company, so if you, I, I don't know who your business is registered with, but if you'd like to switch to Rack, I would be happy to be able to support you. And you'd see what a seamless, easy um, opportunity is. The launch of the Rack Digital Asset Oasis last year, Rack Dow, was such a great initiative that was taken because yes, we can compete in multiple things when it comes to offshore jurisdictions, but let's find a niche that makes us really, really good. And I think that falls with everything that we do that allows us to move much faster. Tell me about your boss. So, um, so the, the, the way, the, way this, um, the Emirate is structured is, is, is uh, we are a government entity. We, 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 do, we do run it as a government entity, but we are very much, um, we, we, we run the business like a corporation. I always feel it's like we're a well-funded startup. So the way the structure is, I have a board and I have a fantastic board with, with some, some great people. One of, one of who I consider one of my icons in tourism, Gerald Lawless, who was one of the first CEOs of Jumeirah Hotels is, 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 is one, of my, my, uh, one of our board members. But um, my boss and the chairman of, of my board is His Highness uh, Sheikh Saud, the ruler of, of the Emirate, who I always say is, um, we're very blessed to have him because the energy that he has, God bless him because very forward thinking, um, uh, you know, was educated in the U.S. Um, but the entire family from him down are very open-minded. They drive us to, 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 to be quite business and savvy minded. Um, but they also allow us to be CEOs that run their businesses that, that give us the freedom to be able to do things. Um, 
um, with especially with his highness and, and the rest of the family, the direction is clear. What is the best thing for the emirate and what is the best thing for the community and the people of this emirate? How can we be better at what we're doing? It's great that you achieved 1.22 million tourists and, and, and grew double digits. What are we going to do next? Mm -hmm. Because we aren't looking at single digit growth. We aren't looking at the small wins. We are looking at a long journey. I will say that um, also with the leadership that we're blessed with, they know that the impact that they do has to resonate not just in the Emirate, but for the UAE in general and also for the region. Mm. Um, so so I, I, I got to say, it's, it's, it is one of my biggest joys is when you, uh, when you have a boss that's, um, and bosses that are quite visionary, that are, that are quite um, charming and, 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 and easy to work with, doesn't mean that they make your life easy every day. There are times where they need to drive you and that resonates. And, and I love that. But we've got clear governance and we, we're, we're in a clear position. But you also got the freedom to make, make stuff happen, which is exciting. Your staff. Yes. Okay. I, your people that work with you, colleagues, uh, co-workers, um, speak very highly of the place to work. And it's been noted well that rack tourism is a great place to work. Why do you think that is? You know, I, I, I love hearing that. And, and it is one of my proudest moments. Um, um, I think, I think a, big, a big part of it is we, we work as a team. There's some good times. There's some bad times. But we make decisions as a team to, 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 to move forward. When I joined uh, Iraq TD over five years ago, we were voted the 17th happiest entity in, in Iraq. I don't know how many entities they are, but 17 has never been a good, good number uh, for me. And we really worked hard. And within one year, we became the happiest entity in, in, in Iraq. And, and this, is, this, is, this is from the ratings of the government. But what we did is it was something very simple. I have a zero tolerance for gossip. Now it's it's fun to say, I saw Spencer at the bar. We had a fun time. Uh, you know, but, but that's that's not what I'm talking about. But, but when it's something that isn't contributing to the success or the growth of the Emirate, or it can be harmful, or it can be, I have a zero tolerance for that. And the team knows that, so you automatically eliminate the negative space, and you start having open communication. So one of the things that we do is every Friday. So this started um, uh, uh, pre-COVID, we used to do our breakfast meeting. So every Friday morning at 10 a.m., the entire team gets together and we, 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 we talk. We say about, oh, this is, you know, we, we give them updates and stuff. Then during COVID, it all went to Zoom. Today, we still do it on Zoom, even though people are still in the office, because I think you can impact as people, people travel. But you automatically have open communication. So they hear from me, they hear from the leadership, and it's not... It's not a, 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 a state of the union speech. It's more like, great, HR's got an update. Here's the fun stuff. We were in a basketball league uh, last week. But also, here's the great openings that are happening. Here's what the PR team did. Here's the, the, the tourists that, that came in this year. We share numbers and then we go have a bite together. Um, that open communication is, 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 is critical. Um, um, I expect my leadership team to give the opportunity to their team to succeed. I'm not a micromanager. I can be if I need to be, but it's not my strength. My strength is to be able to give people the opportunity to, to, be, to be great at what they do. I'm a big believer that you have to surround yourself with people that are better than you. My head of finance is better than me in finance. My head of HR is better than me in managing people. Um, my, my, my head of... Um, uh, PR and marketing communicates. She she communicates ten times better than I do, and that's so important that you surround yourself with people that are better than you that can strive to be able to to achieve. I think we've built a fun work culture. I think we've built a culture that's open, and I also think we are very respondent to people's needs. If you're going through a hard time in your life, we have a hardship policy that that that, that can help you. People go through ups and downs in their lives. You got to give them the opportunity to grieve, to breathe, to take a break, 
to to that because that's only going to help them excel. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we we've had some rough moments in, in an organization. Imagine we went through COVID. COVID tour the tourism industry was the worst impacted industry. Decimated. It, we decimated. I mean. My job is to fly people in and and have them mix and mingle with each other. And overnight that ended. So when COVID hit, I think that was a true test to the testament of our team and 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 how we how we reacted. It, COVID hit mid-March. April 1st, this wasn't an April Fool's joke, but April 1st, we launched a a program that supported all all of our hotels and tourism. So anyone that gets a license from RAC TDA, we had an incentive scheme for them to keep the lights on. So we went to all of the hotels and said, we're waiving fees. We spoke to to FIWA, you know, the mm-hmm. department. We spoke to all the banks. If you've got loans, we'll be able to, to do that. But we took that initiative and then we said, no fees, keep that. And then when we started collecting taxes, we let them, when, when tourism opened and they were able to welcome guests, we let them keep a portion of those taxes so that they can put it back into their employees and do that. And I think during the hard times, if you shine to, to, to uh, you, you come above water as a community, I, I think it helps. And, and that just sort of, that just sort of, sort of led. And then the, I think the final thing I will say is, is learn how to laugh with your team. Yeah. And, and that is important. Not laugh at your team, you know, but laugh with your team to enjoy the good moments because when they're at that dinner table and God knows that everyone talks about people at work at their dinner table, whether it was a good day or a bad day, you want that conversation to be meaningful and positive. Uh, And if you laugh with people when they're having a good time and you celebrate their successes and you give them a hug or you cry with them when they're going through a hard time because you genuinely care about it, that builds that environment around and happy to say we've got that. We know about your business and why people are happy because one of the companies that we own is called Happy Work. Ah. And our business is all about understanding how corporate culture works, corporate wellness Mm. works, and how companies have been good at retaining staff and developing their business with the right kind of people. We also know the ones that have been very weak at it as well by comparison. And, And so... When we look at examples of businesses that are run effectively, it always comes down to what's the leadership like? What's their relationship like with the people? Are the people feeling like they're empowered? And and do the people like going to work every day? Mm. And the most, the vast majority of your employees that overwhelmingly like going to work. And that says a lot for lots of things. But more than anything, it says a lot about you and the kind of person you are. And I'm sure it's very easy for someone like you just to play that down and say, oh, it's not me, it's, you know, it's my team, it's everything else. But at the end of the day, if the shit hits the fan, the buck stops with you. So take the, take, take the praise when it comes your way and, and take the recognition that you deserve because you've been identified in this country as but someone who's doing it really well. Well, th- thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I, I, it's... Uh, um, uh, I would say it's probably my happiest moment is 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 when I know the team is doing well and 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 they're and they're shining. So so I, I love it. I enjoy it. it. It fits in every aspect of my personal life as well because you spend so much time at work. If you're not happy and enjoying and succeeding and and driving, what's the point? If you're gonna go to work and I get, I get it, uh, and, and I sit with a lot of people over this desk. And I interview a lot of people that are in some in very powerful positions around the world doing very important jobs. You have oodles and oodles of likability. Thank you. (laughs) And and, and I can can just in our own interaction here today and that likability, I'm sure, is what a lot of people can see as well. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I I appreciate that. I I, I just... Maybe it's because I started my career in theme parks, so you know how to ride, <laughs> jump on a roller coaster and, and have a good time and scream and, and enjoy. But I do appreciate that and I'm, I'm humbled by it and, and, uh, and, and thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay, lastly, before we finish, mm-hmm. let's, let's roll out the next five years of Rack. Okay, there's, there's some ambitious plans. There's some hopes and dreams that are gonna, are gonna definitely be fulfilled. If I'm, if I'm someone that's never been to Rack before, Okay, and I'm thinking, you know, I, I, I want to move to the Middle East. I want to take advantage of this environment. Dubai's really, really expensive. Abu Dhabi seems like a little bit spread out. 
what what's what's your case? Give me three reasons why I should I should go and choose to make rack my base in the UAE as opposed to as opposed to anywhere else. So so um I'll give you a couple of reasons. One is um when you look to to be based in in a place, what do you look for? You look for livability. So you want to make sure that the quality of life you're getting is a quality that matches your needs, matches your family needs, matches you know, what's, what's required. And I think, um, it, nature has always been a driver of people's happiness and, 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 and prosperity. And the fact that you've got that mountain around the corner, the fact that you can walk on the beach and enjoy the fact that you've got these nature outdoor activities that plays a very, very important. So we are blessed with topography. So come to, come to Ras al because of the topography that can help really elevate your your chakra points and and and, and make a break come to Ra- Ras al Khaimah because it is an opportunity of growth when you look there's very the, the the world is changing very fast and there's very few places where you can see um unbelievable growth like the UAE and especially in Ras al Khaimah and that growth could be personal growth could be career growth could be investment growth and people that invested in Ras al Khaimah couple of years ago have just seen tremendous, tremendous gains. And then the third part is because we're a pretty, we're, 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 we're nice people in Russell. And, 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 <laughs> yeah, no, before, before we get the comments. Yeah. So <laughs> and, and let me, let me tell you, because we are a small community, the community supports each other and moves, it, it, you know, it, uh, I'll tell you, you know, I, 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 I enjoy listening to your podcast and, and, and I, I'll tell you, um, uh, Khaled Al Amri, who was who was uh, one of one of the comedians that you had on your p- podcast recently, um, uh, uh, I expected a very different interview, and I I found um, uh, coming out of that interview, he was someone that was very warm and engaging, and 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 had a really different story than maybe just the the the, the you know the sixty second uh, skits that you see on on social media. But one of the things that he talked about was inclusivity and how the UAE takes care of, um, I, I believe he has a son with autism and, and, and how the UAE more than anywhere else takes care of people in the spectrum. Um, and for us as an emirate, whether it's people that during COVID got sick and we would host them in our hospitals, whether people were scared uh, and we wanted to ensure that we we do it, or wh- whether it was even taking care of your pets as a, as being a pet friendly destination, we do that. And one of the initiatives that I'm very very proud of is we are focused on accessibility because we want to be welcoming to all guests that and anyone that that wants to. So, so when you talk about the disability ca- categories, you've got allergies, mobility, vision, hearing, cognitive. Those are elements that impact people. And for us, how can we make that better? So if you are if you are an autistic kid that gets impacted by sound, why do you need to check in through a main busy lobby? Why can't we have a separate lobby area that that greets you and welcomes you mm. and takes you to your room mm. to to do that? Those are things that we're putting in place. And because we're small enough and because we care about livability, we care about prosperity and growth, and we're nice people. These are the things, the initiatives that we can put forward that I think will be game changers, not just from a tourism perspective, but from an adaptability and livability perspective. That's really interesting. So it's thinking about how everyone can fit in, everyone can belong, everyone can feel like they're, 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 they're not seen as outcast in any way. That's really important. And I think that, that that's, that's something that, you know, me growing up, it, that that wasn't even a on, on on the table. It wasn't even a discussion. And the fact that you're you're doing that and, kind of stuff. And I think Spencer, when you think about it, I hope we all live long, healthy, and happy lives. But at some point in your life, you might break a foot and need to be in a wheelchair. You might have a some form of ailment that impacts travel, that impacts the way you live. That you need a ramp. You need that. Let's think about that ahead of time and make Russell Hema and make this destination inclusive for people at any part of their, at any part of their journey. The, 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 the disability segment, I know in the UAE, I love that they call it people of determination, but, but that, you know, 1.6 billion people around the world are impacted by some form of, um, uh, uh, disability of sorts. 
And I think there, there's a great video on YouTube called The Hiring Chain. And it's, it's, Sting, um, it's, it's a Sting song that, that, that he does. But, but you, can, you, can, you can look it up. It's, a, it's like a two-minute video. But it's called The Hiring Chain. And it talks about how when you do the right thing for someone um, and it passes it on and it shows you how um, a barber hired a, um, a person with Down syndrome and then a client that went there saw the person with Down syndrome and decided to hire them uh, in a bakery. And then the guy went to the bakery. And it's a, just a, a, a beautifully, very whimsical song that's put together. And that's very much what we like to do in Ras al is care about the people, care about the community, and push things forward. Awesome, awesome. Raki, thank you so much for coming to join us on today. Thanks, Spencer. It was a pleasure, and I really, really enjoyed this. Cool.